Hi, I'm Lucy, and I'm totally not a robot. In a previous video, I've started building an 8086-based breadboard computer, and got it into a state, where I can single-step the clock, and confirm that the execution starts at address FFFF0, just as the datasheet says. In this one I want to continue, and more specifically, I want to see if I can understand more about how the code execution works. If you remember, I had to pulse the clock multiple times to increment the address, and it is very unlikely that these extra clock cycles are just there to artificially slow the CPU down, there must be something else happening between the address changes. And to help me better understand that, I want to have a look at all the output signals that I've mostly ignored until now. These are controlled by the 8086, to surface some of its internal state, which is useful because this information can be used by other chips, to decide whether they should be active or not. I'm sure I'll eventually need to hook some of them to something, but for now, I just want to connect each to an LED, and observe how the values change with each clock pulse. And while I'm at it, I think I'll connect the interrupt, reset, and clock signals to LEDs as well, as I feel it might be useful for future debugging. So the plan is to build some sort of status display that would show whether each of the signals is high or low. In order to do that, I'll first disconnect the power, put the computer aside for now, and get a new breadboard, because I feel like I'm going to need some space. I'll once again use my friends, the LED bars, and as you can see, I have four of them here. Let's start by plugging them into the breadboard. Beautiful. This gives me a line of 40 LEDs, but if you were paying attention, you probably realize that I have nowhere near 40 signals to represent, so this seems like an overkill. And it probably is, but what I want to do is to use pairs of LEDs to represent a single signal and also keep an extra unused LED between the signals to serve as a kind of spacer that will hopefully make the quote-unquote display more readable. Let me show you what I mean. I'll couple the first two together, then the third one will be unused, then I'll couple the fourth and fifth together, and the sixth one will be unused, and so on, until I run out of space. And I can do the math for you, this way I'll get 13 double LEDs, to represent 13 different signals, which is great, because right now I have 12 of them, and I can keep the last one for debugging, or for future use. If you're wondering why I'm choosing such a complicated way to do this, that's because I apparently like to make my life miserable. Using a single LED for a single signal, or even using individual bulbs, would be much more straightforward. What I'm doing is completely unnecessary, annoying to build, and it will waste a whole breadboard instead of just a few columns. I really hope it's at least going to look as cool as I imagine. So let's get moving, I'll start by coupling the LEDs together. And I've decided to skip the first one and start by connecting the second and third together, because this way the result will be symmetrical, which is something that my subconsciousness cares about a lot. That's it, that's how it looks, now I need to do the same thing on the other side. Okay, getting there, now each of the pairs needs a resistor. And done, it probably looks like a piece of cake on the video, but goddamn was that annoying. Nevertheless, this is now ready to be added to the rest of the computer, so let's start by connecting the breadboards together. Then of course the power rails, and the 100 nanofarad capacitor. And I think I'll also move the power connection up, to get it out of the way. Perfect. Now I can finally start connecting signals to the LEDs, and I'll start by wiring the clock signal, to the rightmost LED pair. Then I'll do the reset signal, it will be easy to wire, as it sits right below the next LED.
Next, the interrupts. You might remember that the 8086 has two interrupt pins, NMI and INTR, both of which are tied low for now. I don't care too much about NMI, in fact I don't expect to be using it for anything other than testing. INTR on the other hand, I certainly want to watch. It works in combination with yet another pin, INTA, or Interrupt Acknowledge. The 8086 has a relatively complex interrupt mechanism, compared to say the 6502. In order to trigger the interrupt, it is not enough to pull the INTR signal high, the caller then also needs to watch the INTA signal and wait until the interrupt request is acknowledged by the microprocessor. But more about that in a future video. So to make wiring easier, continuing right to left, I'll connect INTA and then INTR. The following one is ALE, or Address Latch Enable. And this is an important signal because it indicates whether the shared address and data pins carry an address or not. Right next to it is DEN, or Data Enable. This is very similar to ALE, it indicates whether the shared address and data pins carry data. And you might be wondering, why there are two pins for seemingly the same thing? Obviously the shared pins can't carry the address and data at the same time, so if there was a single status pin, where high means address and low means data, wouldn't that be enough? And the answer is no, it wouldn't. It is true that it doesn't make sense for both ALE and DEN to be active at the same time, but it's perfectly okay for both to be inactive, because the microprocessor is not using the bus at all times. And it is in fact necessary because in larger systems, other chips, such as the floating-point coprocessor, or DMA, share the same bus, and need to use it for their things, without the 8086 interfering. But more about that in a future video, for now, all I need to know, is that there are three possible states, address, data, and nothing, and these can't be represented by a single pin. So with all that information, let's hook up DEN to the next LED. The following one is DTR, or Data Transmit Receive. This works in combination with the previous, Data Enable pin, and when data is enabled, it indicates whether the 8086 is transmitting or receiving it. And if I look back at the datasheet notation, the R has a bar over it, while the T does not, so high means transmitting and low means receiving. And it looks like I'll need a longer cable to connect it to the next LED, but unfortunately I don't have a cable of the correct length, so I'll just bend a longer one. Hopefully it won't get too messy. The next pin is MIO, or Memory IO. This indicates whether the microprocessor is trying to talk to memory or to an IO device. And this is quite specific to the 8086 because it uses two separate address spaces for memory and for IO, and programmatically, each is accessed using its own set of instructions. And even though the I.O. space is smaller, just 16 bits, as opposed to 20 for memory, they still overlap on the bottom 16 bits, so it's important to use the M.I.O. signal to decide which chips should activate for a particular address. Let's continue with pin 29, W.R., or right. This is quite straightforward, it indicates that the 8086 is writing data to the bus. Moving yet another pin forward, we get to HLDA, or Hold Acknowledge. This is very similar to INTA, and how interrupts work. An external device can ask the 8086 to pause the execution for a short moment by bringing the hold pin high, but then it must wait for the microprocessor to acknowledge the request, which it indicates using the HLDA signal. But you might remember that in the previous video, I've tied the hold ping low, so I don't need to care too much about this functionality right now. The second to last output signal is on pin 32, RD, or read. And analogically to the write signal, this indicates that the microprocessor is reading data from the bus. 
and it's getting a little bit crowded with all the cables, but luckily, there's only one signal left, BHE, or bus high enable. Without going into too much detail, for backwards compatibility with 8-bit devices, the 8086 16-bit bus in fact consists of two 8-bit halves, high and low. By default, they operate together as a single 16-bit bus, but under certain circumstances, it is possible to enable or disable each half independently. And as the name suggests, the bus high enable signal indicates whether the high half of the bus should be used or not. I'll have a closer look at this in a future video. But now, with all the signals connected, I think I can plug the power in. First I want to check that pressing the clock and reset buttons triggers the respective LEDs. It looks like both are indeed working, so let's go through the reset sequence. Four clock pulses while holding the reset button, and seven more after releasing it. It looks like I have broken nothing, there is the FFFF0, as expected. Let's pulse the clock a few more times, just to be sure. And it looks like I can progress to FFFF2, and eventually even FFFF4, so it looks like everything is indeed working fine. But let's cut the power and do one last update to the status display. The display has 13 signals, and it's quite difficult to read like this, and in fact I already don't remember in what order I've connected them. So to fix that, I have printed this cheat sheet on my label maker. I hope I can somehow fix it on top of the resistors, to align with the lights. Now technically, the label is a sticker, so I could just remove the protective layer and smash it on top of the resistors, but one, I'm not Apple, and two, I don't think it would work, there's just not enough contact surface. Instead, I'll try to benefit from the fact that I'm using a breadboard. My plan is to make a couple holes on the label that align with the holes in the breadboard and then use the shortest wire to hold the label in place. I think I'll start in the middle and then add another wire on each side. So there's my first couple holes, not quite orthogonal, but I think it'll work. Let's now put the shortest wire through them and see if it is enough to hold the label in place. And it looks like my plan might actually work, so let's do the same on the sides. That doesn't look too bad, does it? If you're going to replicate this, the one thing to keep in mind is that both ends of the helper wire need to end in the same column to avoid accidentally shorting something. So with that done, I can now plug the power back in and finally have a look at how the signals change with each clock pulse. And unfortunately there is one more problem, it looks like my clock LEDs are no longer lighting up, which is most likely caused by the label pressing on the resistor in an inconvenient way, breaking the contact. Let's see if I can just wobble it back in place. Yeah, that works. So here we are, right after the reset sequence, with FFFF0 on the bus. Let's have a look at some of the signal values. First of all, we can see that ALE is high, which means we should treat whatever is on the bus as an address. Next, MIO is also high, which indicates that this is a memory address. And at this point, that's pretty much all we need to know, so let's pulse the clock and see what changes. So the first thing that you can notice is that ALE went low, which means the 8086 is no longer outputting an address on the bus, which is obvious, because the FFFF0 has disappeared. The next change is, that RD also went low, indicating that the microprocessor will actually try to read data from the bus. And of course I have nothing putting data on the bus at this moment, so it will read garbage, but more about that in a moment. 
One thing to keep in mind is that while the memory addresses are 20 bits wide, the data is only 16 bits, so for anything that is not a memory address, we must ignore the top 4 bits of the bus. And you can easily see them, these are the 4 purple wires on the left, so if I hide them and pretend they don't exist right now, what remains on the 8 white and 8 purple wires is the actual data. Let's move one clock pulse forward, and see what happens. So now DEN went low, which means the 8086 is performing a data transfer, and because DTR is low, it means it is receiving, or reading data, which is exactly what we would expect. So was it reading the data before, when RD was low, but DEN was still high? And the short answer is no, it was just preparing for a read. Because the data does not just magically appear on the bus, some other chip must write it there, and the delay of one clock pulse should create enough room for that chip to fetch the data and put it on the bus. Let's move one clock pulse further, as the 8086 had plenty of time to read the data. OK, both RD and DEN went back high, which means the data transfer has completed, and the 8086 is no longer accessing the bus. And just to be clear, that does not mean it is doing nothing, it might still be executing instructions internally, performing internal housekeeping, or something else, it is just not using the bus at this moment. So with that, let's pulse the clock one step further, and look at it, this looks familiar, it's a memory address again, this time FFFF2. So it looks like it takes four clock pulses to get from an address to another address, let me quickly pulse the clock four more times to check that. Indeed, four clock pulses later, we got to FFFF4. I think this is a solid theory, so let's consult the datasheet, which does talk about this. So the journey from one address to another address is called a bus cycle, and the datasheet confirms that this takes at least four clock pulses, or clock cycles if you want, referred to as T1 to T4. There might be extra delays added by holding the ready pin low, or by the need of internal housekeeping, but for now I don't think I need to worry about that. The datasheet also confirms that during T1, an address is emitted on the bus, during T2 the bus is preparing for data transfer, and the actual data transfer happens during T3 and T4. So I think I wasn't too far off. Let's try to pulse the clock further and see what happens. For more, and we are at FFFF6, so far so good. Another 4, and oh, what is that? ALE is high, so it must be an address, but it is not the FFFF8 that we would expect, instead it is 0 FFFE. So what happened? Until now, the 8086 has only been fetching instructions from memory, but it looks like it is starting to execute them now. And what instructions exactly is it executing? That's quite hard to tell actually, because when the read happens, nothing is putting anything on the bus, so all the pins are floating, so it can be anything. But I do have at least the LEDs connected, so based on them being mostly off, I might guess that it is mostly zeros, though sometimes some of the LEDs stay like 30% lit, so I guess a rogue one might slip in every now and then. So let's do an experiment. I'll create a small file full of zeros, and try to disassemble it. And whoa, you might expect the instruction with opcode 00 to be something simple, but this is not simple at all. My guess would be that the 0 FFFE is the result of BX plus SI, but I'm not going further down this rabbit hole. I can promise you that we'll have a lot of fun with assembly in the future videos. For now, I'm happy with this as it is, and I hope that in the next video, I'll start adding some actually useful things, and not just more debuggers and LEDs.